So in addition to sympathetic and parasympathetic controls that can regulate blood flow, tissue perfusion, or the amount of blood flow through a capillary bed to a given tissue is actually regulated by factors within each individual tissue. We're gonna discuss a few of them. We call this autoregulation. So this enables these tissues to highly specialize exactly how much blood, oxygen, and nutrients that they need, at the exact level of that activity for the organ. And there are two ways that each tissue can do this. Myogenic mechanism, myo's muscle, and through metabolic controls. So again, remember that this is local. This is within each individual tissue. So first we're gonna examine the myogenic mechanism. So it can change blood flow by altering the arterial resistance. Okay, it can change the diameter of the blood vessel. So we saw this response before. If you increase the diameter as we see in this picture, that means you've decreased peripheral resistance and therefore increased the blood pressure or blood flow to that area. So it's inversely related to resistance as we see there, an inverse opposite relationship. So in the, this example, because the resistance has decreased, that means the velocity or speed of blood to the area will increase as well to increase blood flow. You can also slow blood flow by increasing the resistance. So you'd want it to be smaller. Vessels would constrict. Smooth muscles would contract. This is going to increase the peripheral resistance and therefore decrease blood flow to that area. Both of those are able to maintain the local perfusion at a constant level, that's key. If activity is constant or if that organ is constantly doing something at that moment, you need to make sure that you can highly regulate blood flow to that area. So you want to make sure that it continues to have what it needs, oxygen and nutrients. Even though, okay, the systemic blood pressure changes. So specifically, this is gonna be really important in organs that you always wanna make sure that they have blood flow. So if you look at this diagram, if perfusion pressure increases, you're going to have more blood flow to that area. More blood flow is going to stretch the smooth muscle of those vessels in that area. That's going to cause constriction because you don't want too much blood flowing through. Constriction increases the resistance, which will decrease the flow. So again, this is a negative feedback system. This highly regulates a very local area. Now looking at metabolic controls. These we look at the chemicals that are present, specifically in the interstitial fluid surrounding the capillaries, because it's from that fluid that cells that comprise tissues are getting their oxygen and nutrients and actually able to drop off the metabolic waste. The chemicals we're really going to look here are a result of cellular respiration or the ability to make ATP. So to try to briefly review cellular respiration, you have glucose, C6H12O6, and as we oxidize, glucose, we are able to make ATP. That's what the cells want. We also, though, make waste. So we make CO2. And actually, if you look at this, assuming that we have proper amounts of oxygen, so you have to add oxygen, proper amounts, you're going to have about 36 ATP. You're going to have six CO2 and six H2O molecules. So we need to get rid of the CO2 and we can basically move around the hydrogen and oxygen molecules, make some more oxygen, and then you're left with these free hydrogen ions. So the faster that cells are making ATP, the lower the amount of oxygen that they'll have, the more CO2 
the greater the amount of hydrogen ions. That will make the smooth muscle of the local area relax, which means that the arteries will dilate. Dilation, remember, means that peripheral resistance will decrease. Therefore, you're increasing blood flow. Potassium has effects with hydrogen ion. Lactic acid, of course, is hydrogen content, and nitrous oxide also cause dilation. So as CO2 and hydrogen ions accumulate or rise, you want to make sure that the perfusion is increased so we are giving the cell more oxygen and we can get rid of the waste. In cells that are producing ATP very slowly, they will have a lot more oxygen that they're not using, less carbon dioxide and hydrogen, which are the byproducts when making ATP. Therefore, the opposite will occur. They'll have constriction, which will increase the resistance and decrease the amount of blood that's being flown through that area. So we're going to look at a few critical organs specifically and see how blood flows through those organs. So tissue perfusion in the heart. So of course the heart needs to make sure that it's getting adequate blood supply so it can continue to give blood supply to the rest of the organs. So the heart gets 5% of the total cardiac output that's in the body. And of course, that's going to be through the vessels that serve the heart, through the coronary circulation. When we talk about when ventricles contract, of course, systole, typically that would increase tissue perfusion because that means blood pressure would increase throughout the systemic circuit. However, with the coronary, the opposite's going to happen because remember when these ventricles contract, it's gonna squeeze on those blood vessels, increasing the pressure and decreasing the blood flow to the cardiac muscle itself. So the main thing that we look at with a heart muscle is a metabolic control, specifically oxygen. You want there to be enough oxygen in the interstitial fluid of cardiac tissue that way it can easily flow inside of cardiac muscle to allow the cells to make ATP. So whenever the amount of interstitial fluid and oxygen is low, this is going to trigger vasodilators, and this is local, that will directly dilate the arteries of the heart that serve the myocardium that will very quickly increase the amount of oxygen to the heart muscle allowing it to be a more effective pump. Okay, if we look at how tissue perfuses in the lungs, again, that's the way that it flows through the capillary beds of the lungs. So the lungs contain these tiny little microscopic sacs that we call alveoli, about three million. And this is where gas exchange occurs. So of course, we're going to be dropping off the waste gas CO2 and picking up oxygen. So there are a lot of capillaries right there next to these alveoli to allow that gas exchange to occur. So the pulmonary circuit differs greatly in the systemic is that of course the pathway is short because the heart sits just medial to the lungs versus the systemic circuit is everywhere else. Also remember that the pulmonary circuit has a much lower pressure so it's a lower pressure that the right side of the heart has to overcome. Arteries and arterioles are more like veins and venules because these are carrying deoxygenated blood. Also, they are more thin-walled. Think about the pulmonary trunk, and they have a very large lumen. Looks more like the vena cava than it does the aorta. So because they are thinner-walled, the resistance and pressure in these is lower than the pressure in systemic capillaries. Again, that's why the right ventricle does not have to contract with as great a force as the left ventricle. 
so there is no net filtration out of capillaries. So you have equal CO2 and equal oxygen coming in between your blood supply and the actual little alveoli of the lungs. So we want to keep the blood oxygenated and of course oxygen and CO2, if you remember, bind, both bind to heme molecules on red blood cells. They are carried in plasma as well, but mainly carried on the heme. So when we look at in the lungs, the autoregulatory response, again, is very different than in systemic circulations. So systemic blood vessels will dilate when there's low amounts of oxygen, hypoxia, or the amount of hydrogen increases acidosis to increase blood flow. Okay, if you dilate, that means you're decreasing peripheral resistance, so that's going to increase blood flow. Walls of pulmonary vessels, different, they constrict in response to hypoxic or acidotic state. And this is to make sure that the blood flow gets to the lungs itself so we can drop off the CO2 and pick up the oxygen, breathe. That's what ventilated means. Probably at least identified this in lab. We have talked about portal systems before. So again, remember with the portal system between an artery and a major vein, I'm going to have two different sets of capillary beds. And the vessel that drains the first capillary bed and takes it to the second, that's what we call our portal vessel. So that's what we're gonna see in the hepatic portal system. Hepatic refers to the liver. So it's designed this way because of all of the different functions that the liver has. The liver wants nutrient venous blood, so it is deoxygenated, and it's nutrient rich because in the small intestines, that's where we are absorbing these nutrients. It's not going to be high in lipids because we actually absorb a lot of lipids in another means we'll talk about with the lymphatic system. And so depending on the needs of the body at the time, we might want to drop off and store sugars as glycogen if the blood is not nutrient rich, if someone hasn't eaten in, let's say six, seven hours, then you might be breaking down glycogen and releasing sugar into the sinusoidal capillaries of the liver. So remember, sinusoidal are the most permeable. So this allows for very easy nutrient drop off and pick up. Again, depending on the needs of the body at that moment to maintain homeostasis. So if we look at this diagram, you basically have nutrient-rich blood that's coming from the small intestine. Stomach, you're going to have some possible alcohol, drugs, things like that that would need to be broken down by the liver, um, large intestines, vitamins, and for water reabsorption. So basically in the capillary beds of these organs, the stomach, the pancreas, parts of the large and small intestine. We want to go through the second capillary bed in the liver before it goes to the rest of the body. Okay, so it's going to have to enter the liver through this additional vein that's going to take it through the second capillary bed, the hepatic portal vein. So this is going to be, depending again if the person's eaten or not, it might be nutrient rich or nutrient poor. This is important because before the blood's pumped to the rest of the body, we want it to have the appropriate amounts of proteins, fats, glucose, water. So as the blood moves through these very highly permeable vessels, we basically take the components out that we don't want to, keep the ones that we don't, and so that blood that leaves the hepatic veins and then enters the inferior vena cava to be pumped to the rest of the body, after it gets oxygenated, again, has the perfect nutrient levels. So it serves numerous functions. 
So first of all, there's a lot of toxins that we ingest from pesticides that cover our fruits and vegetables to chemicals that are in different medications that we take. So the liver sees these chemicals and knows that it's not natural and is going to start to break them down. It does not differentiate between what could be a lethal toxin from a chemical that's in a medication that you need. So this is a problem because if you take drugs orally, we know that those drugs are going to enter the systemic circuit and go to the rest of the places of the body. So before it does that, it has to pass through this hepatic portal system. So to figure out how much drug a person needs, basically you need to figure out how quickly the liver can, its enzymes can break down those different chemicals. So for example, if 100 milligrams of a particular drug is needed to carry out the proper effect, but 90% of it is destroyed as it goes to the liver, then this drug would need to be administered at a thousand milligram dose. Okay, so the liver is breaking down 90% of that. So that makes sense why taking a lot of medications is so hard on the liver and it increases liver enzymes, which indicate that the liver is having to work very hard to keep the blood clean of chemicals. Certain chemicals found in drugs will too quickly be destroyed to even carry out effects. So these we have to bypass the, the hepatic portal system so the drug cannot be broken down. And so we're going to basically inject it directly into the systemic capillaries. So typically these will be intramuscular injections. Or it could be lower to the surface of the skin, subcutaneous as well, depending on what it is. We look at blood flow through the kidneys. I'm going to try to keep this pretty basic because we will get into this in great detail when we talk about the urinary system. The principle of filtration, basically in the capillaries of the kidney, we call that the glomerulus. And it's a little different than other parts of the body. First of all, the arterial is much larger and actually can accommodate a great, much greater pressure than anywhere else in the body. And this capillary bed, the glomerulus, is actually going to be drained by another arterial. So it does have this different relationship. Fluid is not reabsorbed at this moment. So we will talk about this in a lot more detail with urinary. Do you remember that these capillaries, we do want there to be easy movement of stuff that we might want to keep in the body like glucose or calcium and to be able to get rid of possibly excess sodium or water. These will be fenestrated, so they will have those pores that will make this easier. So in fact, the fenstra make it 50 times leakier than a normal capillary bed in other tissues. Also, the glomerulus is this capillary bed that is basically this huge crazy ball, and that greatly increases the surface area, which makes it easier for filtration to occur as well. So the two different arterioles, one feeds. Again, the afferent is very large, so you have a large amount of blood that enters this capillary bed a small amount of blood leaves. So you create a high pressure here. So this is the idea that you, if you look at the analogy, the faucet obviously would be the afferent arterial that feeds the glomerulus. The sink are the nephron parts of the kidney, the tubules that are gonna collect this excess fluid that doesn't exit from the efferent arterial, which would be the drain. Now, if we look at tissue perfusion in the brain, of course, the brain cells, neurons, are the most sensitive to low amounts of oxygen, which is ischemia. So, if tissue perfusion decreases, you're going to see a response very quickly in the brain. 
it can actually, you can have loss of consciousness within seconds if the brain does not have enough oxygen. So compared to other organs, the brain itself is relatively small. Okay, only about 2% of the total mass of our body. However, it gets 15% of the cardiac output. So yes, it is hogging a lot, but again, the brain controls all the other organ systems of our body. So the brain, like other tissues, can locally regulate the flow. So these are the auto-regulatory mechanisms that are going to have myogenic muscle and metabolic controls that are going to make sure that you have 750 milliliters of blood entering the brain every minute. And although we keep this rate very constant, different parts of the brain may receive more or less blood than others. It depends on the part of the brain that is currently active with electrical activity at the moment. So a stroke or a cerebral vascular accident is when the brain has damage because it is not receiving adequate blood flow and therefore oxygen. This is actually the fourth most common leading cause of death in the United States. So what causes a stroke or a CVA? Blockage of the arteries going to the brain due to a clot Typically, this will actually be one that's been dislodged, an embolus, but it could be a thrombus that's forming uh, the vessels really close as they're leading up to the brain. Or a possible damage to a cerebral artery that has a tear in it, hemorrhaging, and it's leaking blood. So the symptoms, the person will temporarily be paralyzed or paresis, very, very weak feel weird to move, they may lose their vision, they might have difficulty speaking, they might, for whatever reason, not understand when you're talking to them, they might have increased amount of pressure and therefore a headache. Typically, when someone's having a stroke, you're only going to see these symptoms on one side of the body. However, it can affect both sides if there are multiple clots you basically have a large thrombus that gets dislodged and you have several small emboli that are resulting from that, then you could see both sides. Some people's symptoms are much more obvious than others as well. Depends on the severity of the stroke. So risk factors that increase your chance of having a cerebral vascular accident. High blood pressure, hypertension, Having those plaques in the blood vessels, atherosclerosis, especially if they're in the carotid arteries, which of course the internal carotid artery directly serves the brain. Diabetes mellitus, because that affects the vasculature everywhere in the body. Smoking decreases the amount of oxygen into the blood. You have high cholesterol or if the heart rhythm is not normal, even including atrial fibrillation. I know we said that's not near as severe as ventricular, which must be treated immediately. That will increase the risk. And actually, the women have a higher risk of having a stroke than men. And the older a person gets, the greater the chance that they're going to have a stroke. Treatment of a stroke due to this loss of blood flow usually includes medications that will help break down, dissolve the clot, and thin the blood, anticoagulant, which is why a lot of times afterwards they'll tell you to take baby aspirin. Aspirin is a anticoagulant. Skeletal muscle. Blood flow has the ability to change very quickly in skeletal muscle during exercise. So you can, in parasympathetic mode, if that's at a zero, well, you never really have zero. You would just have blood through the thoroughfare, none through the actual true capillary beds. If you start to need that muscle, you're going to increase the blood supply 50 times. We call this hyperemia. And how this works is basically dealing with the structure of the arteries that supply skeletal muscle.
The book does go into some detail with this. I don't want to get crazy detailed. So if I show, I'm going to show muscle in blue, which I know is a little weird. Okay, so this is my skeletal muscle. I have a main artery, okay, that's going to serve that muscle. As I get close to it, it's going to start branching into these other smaller arterial branches, and that will continue branching to the capillaries. So I can make the blood flow to the muscle almost non-existent. If I have contraction at the main vessel, I can increase it slightly if I just have slight contraction at these vessels. So basically having this diverging network allows you to very easily control the blood flow through the skeletal muscle. Okay, remember the skin is the largest organ of the body. Of course, the outermost portion of the skin is the epidermis, which is avascular. So the highly vascular portion of the skin is the dermis. And of course, the epidermis must be replaced frequently because the oxygen and nutrients have to diffuse from the capillaries of the deeper dermis into the epidermis. Regulation of the skin takes place in response to temperature. Touching something warm directly on the skin will cause vasodilation, therefore increasing blood flow to the area. So that's why heat can help increase healing. Increasing blood flow greatly increases healing. However, typically you don't want to leave the blood vessels dilated because that will also make the tissue have some swelling edema there. So usually you want to end with cold. Cold immediately will cause vasoconstriction. So actually an alternating warm and cold a lot of times is what the doctor recommends because of the effects in the blood vessels and how that very quickly helps blood flow perfuse into tissue areas. So the control over skin's blood flow, whether the vessels will be constricted, dermal vessels or dilated, is the sympathetic nervous system. This is because during the sympathetic nervous system is typically when our temperature is going to change. Of course, the more activity the body undergoes, naturally the more heat that's given off, so the higher the temperature, which means that the vessels in the skin will dilate, releasing heat and allowing the body to cool. Remember, blood is slightly warmer than body temperature, one degree Celsius more. Okay, sometimes during a cold response, if you're in fear of your life, you would want to keep the blood close to your core temperature. So in that case, you would want to have vasoconstriction. So basically, the sympathetic is constant communication with these dermal vessels having the exact response that's needed at the time. And this is, of course, why, sorry, I should uh, remind y'all that during a cold environment, you're going to appear pale because literally the blood's not as close to the surface. Whenever you're hot, you're going to have a more flushed look because the blood is closer to the surface. Vessels are dilated, so you have more blood at the surface as well. So a little review. Pulmonary blood vessels constrict in response to hypoxia. So remember, this is low amounts of oxygen. Where blood vessels in the systemic circulate circulation dilate in response to low oxygen. That's true. In systemic circulation, if there's low oxygen, if you dilate the blood vessels, that means that you're re reducing the peripheral resistance, therefore increasing the blood flow to that area. Where pulmonary, if you have low amounts of oxygen, they're going to constrict which forces the blood to stay longer around the lungs so you can drop off more CO2 and pick up more oxygen. Which is not true of capillaries. They're located near almost every cell in the body. That is true. 
They're the smallest of all the vessels. Yes, they can be so small, only one red blood cell fits at a time. One of the avascular structures in the body other than epithelial tissue is the cornea. Remember the lens is avascular as well. And capillaries have a single layer of cells in their walls. Those are those simple squamous endothelial cells. That's true. We know that capillaries do not connect arterioles to veins. They connect arterioles to smaller veins, which we call venules. Why is vasodilation prominent in the skin when a person increases physical activity? Heat is released or dissipated across the skin from the blood to help cool the body. That is absolutely true. Vasodilation have anything to do with nutrient to the skin to induce sweating? Nothing whatsoever. Remember, they get nutrients through the dermis. Skeletal muscles are close to the skin. That's not true. Skeletal muscles are deep. And exercise produces metabolites, glucose, things like that, that would induce vasodilation. That is false. Now we're going to talk about the different pressures as we are moving through the capillary bed and how water moves and how that affects blood flow to tissues. The movement of water across a capillary bed is driven by a process called filtration. Filtration exists movement because of pressure or gravity. In this case, we're talking about pressures. So there are two basic pressures that will force water to move either out or back into the capillary bed. And we're gonna talk about these pressures in great detail. You have the hydrostatic pressure and the osmotic pressure. Hydrostatic is the fluid, so this is basically the fluid that's being pushed on the outside of the wall, so this is going to be an outward flow, which is going to promote filtration. You have a greater pressure inside and you're forcing fluid and therefore things in the fluid, electrolytes, nutrients out, versus osmotic pressure that's going to draw fluid and the stuff that it contains back in, which would be more on the venule side, which we call absorption. So hydrostatic pressure, hydro refers to water. So this is the force that a fluid exerts on the wall of its container. So of course with the cardiovascular system, we're talking about the heart or blood vessels. So you can almost think about like these little openings almost as valves, okay? Valves open in the heart to relieve pressure. So always, again, you're going to have pressures going to move from high area to a low pressure. So blood itself that's inside of our beds is literally exerting pressure against the walls of the vessels or the walls of the heart. This creates that hydrostatic pressure, and that's going to be equal to blood pressure. So again, to remind us that when you have fluid moving from a high pressure area to a low pressure, that is a type of passive process, and because pressure is what is driving the force, we refer to that as filtration. So it's the ability of filtration then reabsorption within capillary beds that allows our tissues to get the oxygen and nutrients that they need and to get rid of the metabolic waste. Hydrostatic pressure in a capillary changes from the arterial end. So as blood is coming in through the heart that provides pressure, we're gonna have higher pressure on the arterial end forcing stuff out, filtration. So the hydrostatic pressure forces fluid out. You have very little fluid that's actually in the interstitial spaces because most of this fluid then will go into the cell. So you really don't have hydrostatic pressures basically non-existent 
against the vessel itself. So it's the fact that you have this much higher hydrostatic pressure on the arterial end than on the venous end that forces fluid out again towards the cells and tissues. And now we're going to talk about the other pressure, osmotic pressure. So osmosis involves the movement of water, not the solute, from a solution that has the lower amount of solute concentration to one that has a higher amount of solute concentration. And the number of solute particles that you have displaced in the higher solute concentration is what drives the amount of, of water across the membrane. So I think about this as making Kool-Aid. You want to make Kool-Aid in two different glasses equal. So solute-wise, if I have more sugar, okay, cherry flavor in one side, less in the other, of course I would want to be able to take, if I could, take some of this water down Kool-Aid, take some of those water molecules and add them to the glass that has too much, that tastes too sugary. And that essentially is what osmotic pressure is. So it's this pressure for water per solute concentration to be equal on both sides of a membrane. And that creates a gradient. And what you wanna remember is that the particle, and for blood we're gonna talk about protein, pulls water towards it. Typically when we think about pressures, you think push. This is a pulling pressure. So it's an inward movement. So if we look at osmotic pressure in the capillary, it's about 25 millimeters of mercury. And this is because of the large proteins that are in blood. Remember the largest, about 50 to 60% of the proteins are albumins. We also have gamma globulins, immunoglobulins, several other types. A lot of these proteins are much too large to leave the capillary. Remember most capillaries in the body are the normal continuous. So they're not gonna have big spaces that would allow these proteins to move. Therefore, the osmotic pressure remains pretty constant as you're going through the capillary's length because the proteins cannot move in or out. The osmotic pressure in the interstitial fluid is very low because interstitial fluid has very few proteins in comparison to the capillary. So the gradient, the difference between the two is going to be 22 millimeters of mercury. And again, this is a pulling, so that's going to be into the capillary. So the difference between the osmotic pressure of the proteins being exerted inside of the capillary bed itself versus the very few proteins that are in the interstitial fluid, again, that creates that pressure gradient, the colloid osmotic pressure, or more simply, oncotic pressure gradient that we have. And again, reminder, this is a pulling not a pushing. So we're bringing water in back into the capillary bed through osmosis, a passive process. The purple here is demonstrating the proteins. There's a lot more proteins that are stuck inside of our capillary wall because they cannot squeeze between these small spaces. Therefore, we have about 25 millimeters mercury that's forcing inward, a pulling. So we're pulling water towards these proteins. Very few proteins in the interstitial fluid, so you don't have that much water moving out. So the net pull is going to be 25 minus three. So again, that's gonna be 23 that are going to be pulling inward. So this is really important on the reabsorption end of the capillary bed, where hydrostatic pressure is more important for forcing out 
causing filtration on the arterial end of the capillary bed. So if you're still kind of confused about the osmotic pressure, read these two slides and you can open the book to help. So just to recap and look at these pressures working together at the same time, hydrostatic pressure refer, refers to the force of movement of blood, mainly by the fluid forcing outward. So you have 35 millimeters forcing outward, 25 millimeters bringing inward. On the venous side of the capillary bed, we've lost a lot of water, so we see that the hydrostatic pressure has dropped significantly to 15, but we have a high protein content. So you have water being forced inward. Keep in mind, we are just looking at what is in the capillary right now. We're not considering the interstitial fluid. So capillary net filtration pressure then is equal to the hydrostatic pressure minus the colloid osmotic pressure of the capillary bed. So again, hydrostatic is forcing outward the osmotic is pulling inward. The difference between these is going to be the net filtration pressure within the capillary. So several of the slides preceding this basically explain this diagram, which I'm just going to describe directly. So we're looking what is inside of the capillary. You have 35 millimeters of mercury. That's a hydrostatic pressure. So that's forcing outward. The colloid osmotic pressure, you do still have proteins inside of the blood. That is a pressure pulling inward. That's pulling inward from 22. So the net filtration pressure, 35 minus 22, is 13 millimeters of mercury. And this is going to be outward, which is why we have filtration dominating on the arterial side of the capillary bed. On the venous side, because again, we've lost a lot of water, now the hydrostatic pressure is only 15 outward but you still have the same number of proteins, so that doesn't change, that's 22. So now that's a negative seven, which means that it's negative seven that's inward. So you have seven millimeters of mercury that's forcing fluid back in. And of course, this is why on the venous end again, we are reabsorbing. So overall, we had 13 millimeters of mercury that we were forcing out, seven millimeters of mercury that we're drawing in. There obviously is this fluid that has this pressure. So we have six millimeters of mercury of pressure that's still outward. So that's fluid that's staying in your interstitial spaces. So we're going to talk about the importance of the lymphatic system because it picks up this excess fluid and will return it back to the cardiovascular system, as actually they show here. So this extra fluid that builds up will end up entering these lymphatic vessels. If you don't like the previous diagram, this is just another way of looking at it. Okay, so we see that blood pressure is really high as blood is leaving the heart. It declines the closer we get to a capillary bed and we're assuming a normal capillary bed. So at the arterial end, blood pressure is going to be higher than the capillary pressure. Therefore, we're forcing fluid outward, filtration. At the venous end, blood pressure is now lower than the colloid pressure. Therefore, we have an inward flow, which is reabsorption.
still you're not reabsorbing as much water as you had, so we see that blood pressure is still low. Notice that the colloid pressure stays the same because proteins are staying within the vessels or within the interstitial fluid. This is a great video if you still feel like you need some help with that. Honestly, the capillary dynamics is probably one of the trickiest parts that a lot of students have trouble with. So edema is when you have an excessive amount of water in this interstitial fluid. And in a healthy person, the lymphatic system should not allow this to occur. So what are common causes of edema? If you have an increased amount of capillary hydrostatic pressure, remember hydrostatic pressure is equal to blood pressure. So if you have a higher blood pressure, that's naturally going to create a higher capillary hydrostatic pressure. Or if you have a lower colloid osmotic pressure, so you have less pressure wanting blood to return back to the capillary bed. This occurs um, during liver disease, cancer, or starvation when you do not have as many plasma proteins as you would have. Of course, proteins are made with amino acids, so starvation would cause that, and the liver is the organ that makes most of the plasma proteins. Peripheral edema occurs primarily in the hands and the feet because the hydrostatic pressure is already higher due to gravity. Pitting edema is when you can gently press your finger on typically the lower limbs and the depression remains because of the amount of excess fluid that's remaining in those interstitial spaces. So even more profound type of edema results from a very low decrease in the colloid osmotic pressure to the point that water will not return back to the capillaries and continues to collect in these interstitial spaces. Um, most commonly, we see it collecting in the abdomen to the point it can make a person look like they're pregnant. So this is all of that excess fluid, that seven millimeters of mercury, that's unable to return back to the body. We call these ascites or ascites when this happens. And typically this is very common, again, if someone has um, any kind of disorder or dysfunction with the liver or cancer, which could involve the liver again itself. So a little bit of review, which statement is true of capillary exchange? So A, the interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure, so this would be the pressure exerted by the water that stays in those interstitial spaces, pushes from inside the capillaries to that fluid. That's not true, it would be the opposite movement. Blood hydrostatic pressure is lower at the venous end than at the arterial end. That's true. That's why at the arterial end we have filtration, the venous end we have reabsorption. Blood colloid osmotic pressure is due to dissolved ions. It's not ions, it's going to be proteins, plasma proteins. And I, I can't read what this says, but filtration, all of it, filtration is the movement from the interstitial fluid. That right there is already wrong. Filtration is the movement from the capillary bed into the interstitial fluid. So I'm assuming this would say into capillary bed. So those two are reversed. Edema is defined as the excess volume of blood in the capillaries. That's false. It's the excess volume in the interstitial spaces. Hydrostatic pressure, the pressure exerted by water, is the same as blood pressure. That is absolutely true. Osmotic and colloid osmotic are the same. That's because of the proteins in fluid. Filtration pressure is the outward movement on the arterial end. That takes into account both the hydrostatic pressure and the osmotic pressure. Edema may be caused by 
increased blood colloid osmotic pressure. That's not true. If you had an increased colloid osmotic pressure, that means you would have adequate return of blood fluid back to the capillary bed. It's because of an increase of blood pressure, not a decrease. Starvation or malnutrition is true because the kidney's unable to make the plasma proteins. Kidney disease is not true. Kidneys do not make plasma proteins. Filtration is the movement of fluid by force such as pressure or gravity. That is true.